Hello everybody. I would like to welcome to the fourth webinar about the EMVA 1288 standard uh, by the European Machine Vision uh, Association. My name is Bernd Jene and I am the chair of this group and also one of the directors of EMVA. As I said already, it's a fourth uh, webinar in a series of four. And today we will discuss really the practical usage uh, of the standard uh, and give an answer to the question, how can we really perform camera comparison in practice using this unique new feature of the standard, this one-page summary data sheet. So uh, the outline of today's webinar will be that I will first explain to you the elements of the summary data sheet and then we will use it to make some practical camera comparisons, making use of what we have learned or discussed uh, in the third webinar, namely all the requirements from the applications. So we will basically use different test cases and see how we can select uh, the best, par uh, best camera and what are the real critical parameters under these application conditions. And last but not least, of course, you have always the possibility to ask uh, questions. Uh, you will see uh, on the side of your screen this chat box, so please uh, use this box. You can already type in your questions at any time and I will then take care of them at the end of this webinar. So let's get started with the, the standardized uh, uh, a summary data sheet where on all one page you find all, informa informa um, all uh, information of importance. And we have actually printed out here on this poster uh, one of such um, a summary data sheet and I would like to explain to you now the different elements uh, in this data sheet. You will see a first block of information at the top and this explains or gives all details concerning the so-called operating point. That means all the parameters necessary that you know under which conditions these parameters have been taken. For instance, here you see that an exposure time of one millisecond was used, a frame rate of about 40 hertz, what kind of data transfer mode was used, what gain, uh, what black level, what environmental temperature was, and what, what was the camera body temperature, and under which wavelengths these measurements have been done. So the idea is basically this block tells you uh, that you can always repeat this uh, type of measurements as it's good practice with every type of measurement. Then we will have two graphs here. And these two graphs are the most important graphs of these 1288 measurements. The first is the so-called photon transfer curve. It basically gives you the variance, the tempo variance, minus, uh, of course, the variance at the dark value as a function of the mean value. And the reason why we have selected this important curve here is it tells you first what is a temple noise and if it's not a straight uh, line as you could see it here in this example, um, then you immediately know that this linear model is not fulfilled and you have to be careful in interpreting all these numbers you see on the block on the side here. So the photon transfer curve basically tells you does the camera um, meet the basic EMVA 1288 linear camera model. The second important graph you find here is the signal to noise ratio. You may remember it is not important how bright our image is but how much noise is contained in the image and this is expressed by the signal to noise ratio and this is drawn always in a double logarithmic plot so that you can basically see the signal to noise ratio from real dark levels, very low ones, up to saturation, so that you can also see this all in uh, detail here. 
Uh, and from the signal to noise ratio, you can, of course, here from this plot, you can see what is actually the maximum signal to noise ratio. That's always close to the saturation point here. Uh, this weak gray line, I hope you, hope you can see it here, is a theoretical curve for the ideal camera. And the real camera is a little bit lower here. And this tells you basically that the quantum efficiency is lower than one. The ideal curve has a quantum efficiency of one. And if the curve, the real SNR curve is a little bit lower, uh, that means this is the effect of the limited quantum efficiency. Then it goes parallel to the theoretical ideal camera and then it starts deviating. And this is the influence then of the dark noise. Uh, and so you get also an idea of the dark noise. You can see basically also what is the saturation. That means the brightest thing you can measure in photons per pixel. And you can see at the point where the signal to noise ratio is one. That means the noise is as large as a signal. This is defined as the absolute sensitivity threshold. What is the lowest number of photons? So in this example, you see you can measure uh, the lowest you can see is uh, just about uh, uh, four photons here, and it goes up to almost 20,000 uh, photons per pixel. And the ratio of these two things is a dynamic range. So in this graph, you get all the important uh, information collected uh, here uh, together. And then on the side here, you have all the important parameters which are derived by, uh, from these EMVA 1288 measurements. And let me show you a little bit in detail what we have uh, all here. It starts with the quantum efficiency, which tells you basically which fraction of the photons are converted into charge you, uh, uh, units or electrons, so to speak. In this case, it would be 65%. Uh, then uh, uh, we have the overall system gain. This is actually the slope here of the photon transfer curve, which tells you basically how many dn's digital numbers you get per electron, or the inverse number you can take as well. Both are printed in this uh, column here. The next important thing is then how much noise do we have basically in the dark. This is the dark, uh, uh, the temporal dark noise, and it's expressed in two units again in electrons. So this is a little bit more than two electrons here in this case. And here we have expressed the same value in dn, which corresponds to about 0.86 dn. So the ratio actually of two, these two numbers uh, is just here, the 1 over k uh, uh, over, over here. And then you see actually these three numbers were the basic numbers which we said uh, are within the model a linear model of the EMVA 1288 standard. So these are the, the, the three basic things. And then we have all the derived parameters from that. So we have then the signal, the maximum signal to noise ratio. As I explained, you will always see this close to saturation. So that's the best possible signal you can get close to saturation, which is here a ratio of 100. And since people think in different units, it's also expressed in dB or how many bits you need to resolve the uh, number of, one, of the, uh, 103 here. And then it's also expressed as one over the signal to noise ratio. The reason is then you can immediately see how large the fluctuation of the signal by temporal noise is in, expressed in percent. So this is signal to noise ratio. Then out basically of the dark, uh, temporal dark noise and the quantum efficiency, we can measure then the absolute sensitivity threshold that, that is at which, how many photons do we need to just get a signal to noise ratio of one. And you see this is uh, here then a little bit more than four. And then comes something important. It's not only expressed in photons, but it's also expressed in photons per square micrometer. The reason is uh, you can use this number, the second number where you um, relate it to the area of the pixel, uh, 
you can then easily compare sensors with different areas. Uh, because remember, the irradiation is a, um, or re irradiance at the image plane is a, a quantity defined per area. And so this is where you can easily compare this. And again, we have expressed it in photons and then in electrons so that you can see all these numbers. That was basically concerning the figure to this lower limit, the absolute sensitivity threshold you see here. Then we have the other thing. We have, unfortunately, also a limitation that the image sensor gets saturated. And this is called then the saturation capacity. And the, you see the very same type of figures uh, that is expressed in photons, in photons per square micrometer, in electrons, and in electrons per square uh, micrometer. Um, then the direct ratio of these two things is a dynamic range. And in the same way as it's ex expressed with the signal to noise ratio, you have the ratio itself, you have expressed it in dB, and you have also expressed it in bits, so that you can easily handle these figures. So far, we had everything what is only related to the degradation of the signal by temporal noise. Unfortunately, we have also degradation by non-uniformities, and this is what's coming now. So we have two types of spatial non-uniformity. One is the dark signal non-uniformity, which is again expressed in electrons and in dN. And the nice thing now is this makes the um, dark signal non-uniform, and you can directly compare it here to the temporal dark noise. And then you see, for instance, here, the temporal dark noise is about two electrons. The dark signal non-uniformity is only less than one electron. So that means in the dark signal, obviously, it's dominated here basically by the temporal noise and not by the non-uniformity for this camera. For other cameras, it might be different. So again, this is very important to see what is the more limiting factor. Is it the temporal noise or is it the spatial non-uniformity? And you can do the same exercise for the PRNU. The PRNU is ex expressed in percent, which simply means that um, this uh, is, is a variation of the sensitivity from pixel to pixel, uh, expressed as a standard deviation. And what you have here, you can compare it now with the inverse signal-to-noise ratio here. And again, you see in this case, the uh, inverse, the temporal, influenced by temporal noise is about two times larger than it is uh, by uh, the PRNU. Finally, we can inspect the linearity error. This is basically the question how far the camera deviates from a linear uh, system. And you see this is less than a percent here. And the final inf piece of information you get is then what happens if I go to large exposure times. Then the dark current comes in. And then you have here the situation uh, that the, uh, you get here 5.8 electrons per second. Uh, let me also compare this with the temporal dark noise. This temporal dark noise of two electrons about has been measured by an exposure time of one millisecond. So if you do now a measurement with one second, you ask yourself, well, what dark noise would I get? Well, then you have this dark noise by this very short uh, uh, illumination time. And you have, in addition, for one second, it is about this 5.8 electrons in addition uh, to the, uh, due to the long exposure time. And uh, then you have to add up these two figures, but be careful. Do not just add. These are standard deviations. And if you add um, um, <clears throat> uncertainties, you have to add actually variances, and that means that this gets a dominant factor here. So you have about six electrons or so for one second uh, exposure time. So you can even use these all these figures 
to get the information about the temporal noise for any time of exposure time if you combine basically the temporal dark noise measured typically at very short times uh, and in addition taking care of the dark current. So you see you have in that case at one second for instance the dark noise level is about three times uh, larger than at very short exposure times. So um, the next thing you might ask yourself how accurate are actually all these figures? And let me start here with the quantum efficiency here. Let's start with this figure here. I make a cross here. Because this is measured actually by comparing photons to electrons. That means we need an absolute calibration in that case. And this absolute, the error of this calibration, absolute calibration is about three to 5% uncertainty. That is what you have to keep in mind here. That means if you compare now two data sheets where the um, quantum efficiency is 1% different, forget about it. That's not actually a significant difference because this figure has an absolute uncertainty of about 3 to 5%. And that since many other parameters are basically based on the quantum efficiency, you have the same error about in other quantities, and this is everything what has the unit photons um, um, uh, in it, because the number of photons we are counting by absolute calibration. So everything what I make across here for all these quantities here, where you have the photons, they have about the same type of uncertainty here. Um, as the quantum efficiency itself. So, are there other possibilities of uh, uncertainties? Well, this is the case because the overall system gain here, which basically transfers everything from, uh, from um, uh, dNs, what you are measuring in electrons, this is basically given by the slope here of the photon transfer curve. Um, and now let's go to an example where I show you what is going to happen uh, here with if this is not correct, because then everything basically, if this system gain, which is coming here from the photon transfer curve is not correct, everything what is basically going from what you are measuring to electrons, all these things will be, co uh, will be influenced uh, by uncertainties in the estimation of this gain. So everything what has here electrons uh, will be caused by, uh, will influence by this effect. So let's go back to the slides here. Um, I have only put all these slides in here so that you can follow that up. That is what we have discussed here. And uh, now we look for this nonlinear photon transfer curve. And here I have shown you a measurement with gain um, zero, so the smallest gain this camera can have. And you see clearly that there is a deviation between the measuring points. These are this very dense, a little bit curved uh, uh, row of points. We have so many points in here actually <laughs> that uh, you hardly can see the individual measuring points and then the regression line uh, deviates. And, um, then you get basically a little bit um, too, um, too low uh, slope of this curve because of the nonlinearity. And if k is too low, then the quantum efficiency is a little bit measured too high. People who uh, do careful measurements and observe this thing, they typically do the following. We know that this nonlinearity appears close to saturation, so actually here in these points. And uh, so just let's do another measurement with a higher gain. So let's put the gain to 60 dB, which is uh, uh, two times higher. And now you can nicely see uh, basically that uh, now you can hardly see a difference between the measuring points and the regression. And interestingly, the quantum efficiency is now a little bit lower. It's here in that case 68.4%, uh, whereas in the previous measurement where we had a little bit of curvature in the photon transfer curve, 
we had about 1% higher, which is relatively seen 1.6% uh, too high. So it's actually not significant in that sense because the absolute error is still higher, but it explains you that there might be slight biases in the gain and as a consequence also in the quantum efficiency and in all these numbers I have marked here uh, in green. There is another effect which you might have. Imagine you have only an 8-bit digitization, that means a camera with only a very coarse um, a quantization, but a very low dark current, a dark noise level. What then is going to happen is that basically in the dark part of, the, uh, uh, of your curve, of your photon transfer curve, the temporal noise is so low that you will also always measure the same value. And that means you can no longer reliably actually measure the noise level in the dark image. And this, of course, must be noted in the data sheet. And you find then always if basically this value here is 0.49, that's the lowest useful measurement you can do. And if you will find this number, you will typically find also a sign here. And you will find a footnote down here that this is actually spoiled by quantization noise and that you cannot make a reliable dark, uh, dark noise uh, measurement for this thing. So that means the quantization in that case is too coarse and the camera gets worse by this, uh, by this coarse uh, uh, quantization. So uh, then we can go to the second block, namely now doing direct comparisons uh, using the new summary data sheet. And um, what I am going to do is again to repeat the selection criteria we have discussed already um, in the last webinar and we stated that there is no best camera actually away level. And uh, so we have to think about uh, what is the most critical parameter from our application. That is all what we discussed yesterday. So it's a question is how many light do we have away level? What is the dynamic range in the scene we observe? What are the basically uh, needed or tolerable exposure times so that we can see is a dark current important or not? And what is basically the required SNR for subsequent image processing? Um, it could be either, it should be as good as possible or we simply need a certain threshold. That is all what we discussed yesterday. So now let's start with the first application example. Let's just say we have plenty of light. So no problem at all. Actually, the interesting thing is then under this condition, the quantum efficiency is actually not very much of importance. Uh, then only we uh, produce uh, less electrons, but if we have enough light, we can just take more light and then we get still enough electrons. So what really limits then the quality of the signal in the camera is the maximum SNR this camera can produce. So actually this value we can see graphically here right out of the SNR plot or what we see here in this thing. That is the essential thing. And this is related directly if you go to the equations, the square root out of the saturation capacity expressed in electrons. Be careful at that point because you see the SNR is all, this is only the part by the temporal noise, but we have in addition the PRNU. So in that case, basically where the PRNU is lower than the, uh, the inverse uh, SNR, it's not a problem. But in other cases, it might actually be the case that the non-uniformity is larger than the temporal noise. And in that case, we have to take care of the total SNR we discussed actually in the second uh, webinar. So uh, then please be careful and look whether actually the limitation of the variation close to saturation comes from spatial non-uniformity or from temporal um, variations at the very same pixel. 
That is a situation with plenty of light. So all what you have to do is check for your SNR, and then you can look for your application. If you have, for instance, just a threshold you need, you can take any camera which fulfills this threshold, so even maybe a quite cheap one. Um, and But if you want to have as good as possible SNR, you probably have to select a more expensive one. So uh, then let's come to the inverse case where we have really dark scenes and only uh, short exposure times. So let's first look for, we have not plenty of light, we are starving for light and can only afford short exposure times. Well, then the clear critical parameter is not the SNR, it's a maximum because we anyway won't reach that. Um, but it is basically the level of noise in the dark signal and that means uh, it is basically the critical parameter is basically the, the temporal dark noise. And if you look how you can compute basically the, the uh, absolute sensitivity sh threshold, it is roughly the standard deviation of the dark noise divided by the quantum efficiency and you have this strange plus one half. This basically comes from the slight curvature of this curve here. So if you go through the mass, you will find you have to add this one half. Uh, you can calculate, this is now in photons. That is what we are used if you deal with, a, with, a, with an image sensor. But if you deal with the environment, you typically use minimum irradiance. That means units watt per square meter at the image plane. And to get to that value, what you basically have to do is the following. You have to take this number of photons, which is the absolute lim uh, limitation. You have to divide it basically by uh, the area of the pixel to get to something per area. And you have to divide it also because you have to go to watts, uh, you have to divide it by the exposure time. So that means if you have fixed your exposure time now because of your application, you need to have a quick uh, acquisition of images. That fix is basically the minimum irradiance. This is still, of course, in photons and to convert it in watts, you have to multiply it with the energy of a single photon, which according to Einstein is basically the Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelengths of the radiation. So that is the equation you see here. That gives you the minimum irradiance. And now you can see something interesting. The first thing is, of course, the shorter you are forced to expose, the more problems you have. Because if you take only half the exposure time, you have only half of the minimum, uh, you have the double uh, minimum irradiance. And the same is quite clear. You can measure smaller irradiances the larger the size of your pixel is, because you are just collecting more photons. So obviously you need, if you really want to measure minimum irradiances, you need large pixels. So you may ask yourself, if you, we go again back here, uh, you see here the interesting thing for the saturation is here, let me take another color, is this quantity, about 900 electrons per square micrometer. And then you might think, well, this might be the same for all image sensors, because you obviously can collect per area a certain number of, uh, of electrons only, but this is not the case. Let me give you two examples. I have one sensor here, another sensor with pixels of 1.85 micrometer in size, pixel, and they have basically 11,000 electron saturation capacity, which ends up basically to a figure, let me write that in front of about three, 1,200 electrons per square micrometer. That is what you get here for this type of sensor. You see, it's about uh, almost four times larger than for this sensor. Then I take another one, a 4.8 micrometer sensor. This 
interestingly, has a lower saturation capacity of only 6,300. Also, the pixels are about three times larger. And then you end up, of course, here with a much lower Oops, now it's all going away here. But I have shown you the last thing, so let's just get that away uh, or just keep it here. Um, you see, there is one order of magnitude, might there be different uh, between these two figures? And that clearly tells you you not necessarily have to go to large pixels. There might also be sensors with small pixel sizes and still a large saturation capacity. So carefully look uh, for these figures. Of course, if you have for small pixels, large saturation capacities, you need a lot of light. But this is all what you have to study in detail. So let's go to the final two cases. If we have a dark scene now and you have plenty of time. Classical application is, of course, astronomy. And uh, the other uh, example is in biology and microscopy. Um, and here, actually, then, the limitation is no longer by the temporal dark noise, but actually by the smallest dark current for large things. And I have uh, shown you, you see what basically is going to change. Instead of the standard deviation of the temporal dark noise, divided by the exposure time, you simply have now the dark current. And this, since the dark current is not given in photons per second, but in electrons per second, you have also to divide by the quantum efficiency. But that gives you really then, for long exposure times, the dark current limits the minimum irradi uh, irradiance you can measure. Well, last example, completely um, more demanding is you have both very dark part in your scene and also very bright one. Typically, the things you get if you are outdoors. So everything what has to do with automotive uh, imaging or with anything with what has to do with survival in, uh, in outdoors. There you have a lot of contrast in your scene. So you need a high dynamic range. And this high dynamic range is uh, basically the ratio of the saturation capacity divided by the absolute sensitivity threshold. So you need a camera where both you have a, a very low absolute um, a sensitivity threshold and also a high a capacity to be able to measure good high dynamic range scenes. Well, this uh, closes uh, our considerations. And I hope that these four examples I showed you with very different conditions, with very different application, gave you the impression how easy it is once you have this knowledge about your application to apply basically the standard, the 1288 standard in an appropriate way. Uh, you cannot simply pick out one parameter and say that is the most important you have to really go uh, to your application uh, and look what are the characteristics of your application. So now it's your turn to ask some questions, if you have questions. Um, and, um, and I hope that uh, I can then answer your question. Well, everything seems to be clear. Uh, then I uh, would like to thank you again for your attention. But before we are close, let me show you uh, some hints for further material and courses. Uh, first, I should mention, if you missed one of these webinars, no problem. Uh, you will receive a mail as soon as all these uh, recorded webinars are uh, online again, so that you can watch uh, the uh, webinar again if you want. And then you will also find basically the uh, slides uh, for download, uh, so that you do not need to remember all these links here. Uh, you can get standard documents and data sheets from these two links I have mentioned here.
Um, oh, and I see there is a question meanwhile. Well, no, it's actually not a question, only uh, obviously uh, the message, message got through. And uh, so you thank me, but actually it's the work of a whole group, of course. Uh, I could never have uh, developed this standard for my alone, but it was joint work basically of an international community uh, which sat together and said we need to do something like a standardization. Well, you can meet me in person if you like. There is um, uh, always this international machine vision standard booth at the vision in Stuttgart, actually already next week. And I will be basically all the three days at this booth. Uh, and you will not only see the 1288, but Jenny Cam and all the other standards which are available. <laughs> and now for those of you who really not only want to use a standard, but who want to do measurements and understand these measurements or in the development of uh, cameras, uh, there we will have hand-on seminars where you learn uh, basically how to perform the measurements in the best way, where you get really practical exercises. We will perform direct measurements during these hands-on hand courses. And it will, uh, one will be in December uh, uh, with Framos in Munich, and the second one uh, will be uh, in March next year uh, in Hanau, uh, here close to Frankfurt. Um, and also for the March um, uh, hands-on seminar for the first time, uh, there will be the possibility to get certified. And for the uh, certification, uh, you will, um, uh, will get soon information uh, from the EMVA. So there is another question here from the crew here. Oh, there were some, yeah, there were some other questions um, posed actually before the webinar, and they made me aware of that. Uh, one a question I remember, and that was a question, uh, well, the standard at the moment is only uh, defined for monochrome and color cameras in the visible. So you typically do these measurements for a, a monochrome in the green, and you do the measurement for a color camera, uh, depending on the color pattern you have, typically in red, uh, a green, and blue. And now you know, interesting, uh, actually, um, uh, developments are in the shortwave infrared. These cameras are getting cheaper and cheaper, and so they are getting more and more usage. And the question is simply, can the standard be applied to shortwave uh, infrared? And the simple answer is yes. It's only at the moment not formally uh, adopted by the standard. But you can still do all valid measurements in this range. The same, of course, applies to UV. In, uh, in the UV, the only thing you have to take care of, there might be the situation really in short UV. So if you go to below 300 nanometers, that one photon actually has so much energy that it can not only trigger to get one electron uh, in the conductance band, but two of them. And then the model is no longer uh, perfectly correct. But you can do the measurements, no problem. You can also do the EMVA12 measurements uh, for nonlinear cameras, for instance, logarithmic sensors. The only thing is the model does not apply, but still you get a lot of useful parameters out. And uh, we are actually working on all these extensions uh, to make that uh, uh, more visible also to the community, how you can extend the uh, measurements of the 1288 standard to all these uh, new possibilities. So, um, yeah, thanks uh, here also to the crew for uh, guiding me here. And um, I would like to say goodbye to you now. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, use this plenty of other opportunities to educate yourself about uh, uh, the standard. And I would uh, uh, like to welcome you again at one or the other uh, occasion then. Thank you very much.